check. Check, check, check. Mic check. Dude, we are rolling with another episode of Industry Interviews. I am your host and good buddy, Dan Brown Jr., creative director and composer of the Emmy-nominated Crime Sonics. And today I am joined by violinist composer Natalie Bonin. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm hot. The air conditioner yeah. broke in my studio. <laughs> oh, no. Well, actually, I just worked out, so I can say that, yeah, I'm still kind of <laughs> in that mode. Yeah, it yeah. sounded like, uh, I don't even want to articulate what it sounded like. It was rough. It was really loud and spooky. I had mics oh, on. Like, whoa, 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 what's breaking? Nope, it's just the air conditioner. Oh, gosh. Well, <laughs> you will survive. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think I'm melting in here. It's crazy. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> so, so check this out. I, you know, I, how do I say this? I'm on, I have several of your websites pulled up in front of me. I've been <laughs> digging around into everything that you're doing. I have done maybe 30 of these podcasts now. And okay. I, I honestly do not know where to begin with all of this. <laughs> <laughs> you are one busy lady. So let's do this. Let me start at the okay. beginning. And okay. I think everyone listening to this episode is going to be like, whoa, this <laughs> lady does some cool stuff. Okay, back up. Where are, you, right. where are you from? You're not LA, are you? Well, actually, I was born in San Francisco, but my parents are from Montreal. So I actually grew up in Montreal. In Montreal. Montreal, yes. Montreal. I'm thinking Toronto. Where the heck no, is Montreal? No, Montreal is the French side. It's in the Quebec. You, so yeah. Quebec, is that, uh, hold on, no, Quebec, where, where is? The Quebec Troy? province is actually the province, uh, the, the province that's just east of Ontario, where Toronto is. So if I, if I am in Detroit and I go over the Ambassador Bridge, where do I end up? From Detroit, I guess it would take about 10, 11 hour drive to go like east, uh, okay, northeast. So yeah. Yep, geography. I'm usually pretty good, but I'm going to blank <laughs> on where my goal is. It's a six hour Drive north of New York with no traffic. That, that way, gives you okay. Idea. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I spent a night in Niagara in the middle of winter one time. Oh. Yep. So, wow. I, I'm not going back, lady. Nope. Nope. <laughs> That's hard, hard time over, over there in the winter. So, you grew up in Montreal. That's pretty cool. So, is that where you went to school for music? Tell me about all that. Well, there were many episodes in my life. So um, I grew up in Montreal. My mother, well, I'm an only child. So my mother's dream was actually to homeschool me. And so she did until um, I was 14, actually. So wow. until the age of 11, I was pretty much homeschooled and had um, group and then private teachers and violin music. And then we moved to New York when I was 11. They just went on a sabbatical and wanted to get out. They thought of Europe. We ended up in New York. Uh, mainly actually um, for music because they didn't really care whether it was New York or Europe, just somewhere else. And for me, um, as a burgeoning violinist, they felt that New York had really great teachers at the time. So I ended up there, joined the New York Youth Symphony, had amazing teachers from Juilliard Manhattan School until the age of 14 uh, when basically my family bubble blew up a little bit. <laughs> my parents divorced hmm. and I had to go back to school. And so I ended up um, finishing my high school with normal people, with everybody in the classroom, which was kind of a shock. <laughs> yeah. So what yeah. Was that like? I mean, it has to be culture <laughs> yeah. shock for you, right? Yeah. And then I pursued classical music um, yeah, at McGill University. I, I got accepted when I was 17 um, at McGill. So basically that was kind of all my my first phase of classical training in violin. I want to back up. Did you, did you like going to public school? Well, it was actually a private school. It was, just, it was just school, which I had never experienced. And I think they were smart in putting me at the time in a girl's private school, so I didn't have to deal with everything all at once. Hmm. Um, you know, boys and, <laughs> and the, whole, the whole situation was like a little overwhelming. But I was very studious, and, and I think the discipline of music had taught me a lot about uh, being kind of independent and being able to learn by myself a lot. So it wasn't like a very social time. I, I was practicing at least four hours a day when I was in high school, plus the schoolwork, plus adapting. And so it was kind of like Olympic training, I would say. I would kind of relate to that. I, I was doing a lot of national competitions and um, yeah, it was very, very intense. 
I remember when I grew up, <clears throat> I absolutely went to public school. I grew up very poor, which I've shared on this podcast many times. Mm. And I think about, um, you know, growing up in middle America, not a segregated community, very yeah. mixed culture community right. and very rough community. Yeah. And it's interesting because I think when everyone become, you know, when people become adults and however their lives play out mm -hmm. or pan out, uh, and if you're someone, I would say like us that has that like high drive and that, um, right. almost need right. to succeed yeah. in a way, almost mm -hmm. like you, like you, I, I don't, it's a I survival can't, thing. You need yeah. It. I can't, <laughs> can't speak for you, but I, I, I have this like, no, 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 I will win. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't understand. I'm winning. <laughs> right. But I think, I'm not going to fail. Fail is no option. There's no option. But I think that comes from, you know, like my upbringing. So it's interesting to hear what you talk about, um, like, you know, homeschool and then the private school and then all the, you know, the lessons and the, you know, like the Olympic training that you say. Right. It's I mean, like, and nothing is perfect. You know, I mean, yeah. I'm not saying that I had the perfect set up I, it was just my experience which i i, I um recognize as very unique um yeah. i don't know many people who went through that sort of path um and i did miss the social aspect of going to school and actually learn things much later <laughs> not you, hurt you, later and in, in things that i should have learned in the backyard of the school you know it's you know stuff that's nothing is perfect I'm, I'm curious what was the what was the reasoning for homeschooling? Were your parents religious or was there, was there another reason no, for it? Well, no, my dad um, was a psychologist and my yeah. mother actually had been a teacher for a large part of her life. She was actually, after that, she became a biologist, um, like on a master's degree level. Um, but it was just her own dream of homeschooling. She just really believed in that for many reasons to, to kind of adapt it to the child um, and to make sure that I was kind of, you know, my talents were recognized and, and to help me on the music aspect as well, because school was not really adapted to my musical training either. So I think that was all part of her idea of, um, yeah, just, just her dream connected to my own dreams and trying to make that work. Yeah, that's very, that's very cool. I, um, later in life, when I was in my early 20s, I'm in my late 30s now, but in my early 20s, mm -hmm. I had, I had uh, started attending church and I had meet, I met all of these, I don't want to say religious people, but mm -hmm. very, like very, um, you know, very wholesome church faring mm -hmm. folk. And many mm -hmm. of them were homeschooled. And so the story that yeah. you're sharing with me is very similar to theirs where... Well at some point in time, they end up going, you know, like to like high school or college. And it's like, what? Wait a minute. How do I do all this other stuff? I didn't learn those skills yet. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, it, yeah, I think um, the funny thing is I have to, to say that actually my parents are ex-religious people in the sense mm. that my dad was actually a priest uh, mm. when he was younger. My mom was actually a nun. Um, wow. and, and yeah, so it's, it's kind of a funny thing. But the homeschooling, I don't think had anything to do with that. Or if it did, I never heard about it. Uh, I think it was really mainly her own beliefs and dreams. And at the time, I think we were two people, two uh, kids in Quebec being homeschooled. And I went to um, like this, this, after a year of homeschooling, they took me to take the exams and basically saw that I was actually almost a year ahead already mm -hmm. after just the first year from homeschooling. So they never bothered <laughs> asking for another test because they figured okay she's doing well um i guess my mom was doing a good job and it worked out for us you know um and it truly helped me for my musical um training as well because it helped me get a lot more practice hours in my day what did you musically what did you start with was it voice or was it violin it was violin violin um yeah and i started when i was four my mother took me to this concert a kid's you know annual concert and she just wanted to see if I liked it you know no expectations whatsoever and then I told her that I loved it and I had just won you know I was just sad that I couldn't join them and play oh. with them and so we went to see the teacher I remember that very vividly we went backstage and and met with uh, Mrs. David is her name and then um, I joined the school and took those classes for five years um, they were group classes until when I was nine, I started having private lessons. 
with her son, actually. <laughs> Let's fast forward a little bit from, so high school, you're done, and then is that when you bounced to New York? I bounced to New York from 11 to 14. 11 to yeah. 14. That was amazing. I was just, I guess that was the core of where I became a musician. That's where I really knew that was what I wanted to do, even though there were some doubts later, but that was really where I, I, I think that major chapter of my musician's life um, was, you know, I had amazing teachers. I had experiences playing with uh, pianists that were accompanying world-class um, players and I was going to classes at Juilliard, uh, had coaches from Manhattan, um, was in this am amazing youth orchestra with the top Juilliard students playing there. And David Allen Miller, who actually was conductor then, then, then became uh, and is still the director of the Albany Symphony. So, you know, I, it was just surreal. I got to play in Carnegie Hall when I was 12 years old um, in that orchestra. And we played in Carnegie Hall uh, basically three programs a year, but six days uh, a year, and sometimes at Lincoln Center. So, you know, imagine that for a kid. <laughs> it's just... Yeah, and you said that you had some doubts later on? What, what uh, musically, what kind of doubts did you have? Well, what happened is that when we came back, that was a, a very big shock for me. Um, well, my family kind of blew up in a way. Um, I think there was a lot of stress um, over all those, the traveling, my my you know, my parents were not legal to work in the States, obviously, because they're not a U.S. citizen. I was, but I couldn't bring them in. I was too young. So my, my father had to go and basically work in Canada, bring money back. And that put a lot of stress. Basically, when I, we came back, um, I started school for, you know, normal sort of school. And, and then I went to university and it was just like, I was following this path of, oh yeah, she's going in music. That's obvious. That's what she's going to be doing. And people were saying, oh, she's going to be the next such and such players, uh, kind of comparing me to whoever was you know, famous in Quebec at the time. And just felt like my dream was, was prelapsing me. Like I, I wasn't really choosing anything. And then I started doing other things like martial arts and yoga and, um, I was dating a medical doctor at the time also, and I had a very scientific interest as well. And the doubt became important when I realized at some point, or I questioned, why am I so important, you know, doing music while my boyfriend is saving lives in the ER every day, and I'm here practicing four or five, six hours a day on these ridiculous notes that who cares? You know, it just, it was like this major questioning period and it was strong enough for me to actually go back um, and do all my pre-med and I actually got accepted in med school. That's, that was how, how much I needed to kind of do a detour to solidify my music decision, you know, and that actually took me to get accepted in med school. And then I had this big decision in front of me, like where, what am I going to do? I can't do both. And I sort of, I was, um, after all this, I was about 23. I decided to go to Italy for a whole summer. I saved up some money, got auditions from Italian orchestras and figured out a path where I was going to be there for three months and worked a little bit. You know, I, I mean, I, I lost about 20 pounds that summer because I really didn't have much budget. But it was amazing where I reconnected with me and the music playing in these old churches and, and you know, old Europe. It's just incredible. I was playing Bach and, and it just something almost spiritual came out of this where I, I really felt like music was part of me and I could not let that go. Um, even if I was interested and felt the calling for me for medicine, I, it was just not me, not in this life anyway. <laughs> so I ended up coming back and, and leaving the doctor, leaving medicine, <laughs> leaving, leaving all that behind. But something had changed there. And that was very important for where I am today, because that's where I also realized I needed to decide what I wanted to do in music. I didn't want people to decide what I was going to do. I didn't want to be sitting in an orchestra playing, playing the same symphonies all my life. I needed more diversity. 
um, different projects. I needed to express myself, create. And so then I started working in, with, with different pop, jazz uh, groups and learning a lot about all these other types of music and, and touring in, you know, in Europe and all over the place with these different groups. And that was just great. Um, I started doing sessions, playing on soundtracks, doing commercial work. And that's where I realized, oh, this is more me. Like this, this feels more like what I want to do. Let's fill in that gap a little bit. Mm -hmm. Not everyone can just decide, okay, I'm not going to go into medical school. I'm just going to go hop into this orchestra now, and I'm just going to go play on this, and I'm going to go tour over here. Let's talk about how the lead into that. So when you made that decision, mm -hmm. okay, I'm not going to work in medicine. I'm going to go for music. <laughs> how, how, how did you start establishing uh, the connection, getting those gigs, lining that up? Paint the picture to someone who okay. is the younger version of you who wants your life. I was totally fearless. Totally, like yeah. not reckless, but totally fearless. I did not care it, if I would, you know, I, I don't, I didn't care. It was like, this is where I want to go and that's it, you know, and failure is not an option. I was like, yeah, this yeah. is where I am. And I was, I wasn't arrogant about it. It was just like, yes, I'm going to do this. And so my first experience when I came back from Italy was actually calling schools, calling, um, the Montreal University, finding people that might have heard of combos, jazz, whatever. I wanted to experience something else. And I heard about this trio, this jazz fusion trio that needed a violin player. And I remember on the phone, the guy said, okay, have you ever played jazz? I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Can you improvise? Yeah, of course. And I was in my head, I was like, oh my God. And and then he said, okay, let's, let's meet next week. And he sent me a bunch of stuff. And man, did I practice. And did I practice like mad. <laughs> I didn't understand any of those, those chords. You know, it was just nuts. Um, and it was definitely not the blues. It was just crazy chords. Um, so, yeah, I mean, after the first uh, time we jammed together, he obviously realized that I had not the experience that I kind of, <laughs> said that I had, but he yeah. saw the fire in my eye. He saw the devotion. He saw the work that I put in and I worked like mad for those two months preparing for what was the off jazz festival at the time playing. We were kind of doing the after sets of the major jazz festival in Montreal. So yeah. I ended up playing at this bar after three months. Um, and um, a funny story is that I found out that Jean-Luc Ponty, you know, the famous violinist, uh, Ponty, you would say in English, was coming to town. He played with Frank Zappa, Mahavishnu, and all these greats. And I, it was my idol. I was listening to all his recordings because it was helpful for me. Yeah. And I invited him, and he actually came to my gig, you know. So, I mean, I think this fearlessness brought a lot of extraordinary things. Uh, it was risky, I guess, but I put so much effort. I would practice 12 hours a day, if not more. I would work out listening to music. I would, I would just dwell in it, you know, 24 seven. And yeah, that's kind of hard. You, you know, you said something that's interesting. You said, I was fearless and it was risky, but, but was it? Like, what was the risk? I'm th the reason why I'm asking that is I'm thinking again, like, right. think, about the, think about the younger you, think about the person, any, any player who, um, what's the word I'm looking for, has that uh, insecurity, like, what is the risk, really? Well, the risk is ego, the risk is failure, right. the risk is mainly just looking ridiculous in front of people, basically, being shamed in front of a public, you know, something like that, being, feeling like you're a imposter maybe and yeah not ready or not at a place you deserve i mean all these things creep up obviously i've thought of all of these things and i was so nervous the first gigs and also it was mandatory that we learned all this by heart um because he wanted that and i was it was really hard i mean the parts were hard and improvising learning all those chords too by heart were you know they were not normal progressions it was really hard and um, so there was, for me, a big risk of really looking ridiculous in front of all these people that were used to hearing great jazz, 
great players in one of the most famous clubs in Montreal. So I think that was the risk. But in a way, that's why I say I was fearless also because I didn't care. I didn't want to care. I wanted it so badly that I felt like, well, you know, whatever. I want to do this. That's it. You know. You're right. What is the risk? Ego, right? Right. You ever been to Legoland? No, I haven't. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Legoland? The, the oh, six, six yeah. Five? So yeah. one time uh, we took our son there. He was just uh-huh. a little guy too. And we were, it was packed summer day. I mean, that place was just crawling full of people. And we're in the, the food, I guess you call it a food court area. Right. And we're standing outside. We got our food. And I feel this like, it almost felt like someone flicked me on my back. And I was like, what in the world is this? And I look over and a bird had dumped right on my back. <laughs> And I'm like, what in the world is this? And I, and I look up and I took one right in the forehead in there. Oh, no. And it wasn't in the eye. That's pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, right. It's like the like 28 Days Later horror movie, <laughs> zombie apocalypse or something. So I'm standing there literally covered in bird poop. Oh, and, no. And, and my wife looks at me and sees this. <laughs> and she just starts busting up laughing. And then my son's looking at me, probably like four or five. He starts laughing. Oh, man. And then this entire outside food court <laughs> is just cracking. And I'm standing there. And I'm literally in this moment <laughs> thinking, this is what actual humiliation is. <laughs> this right here, like, there's no swagger right now. No. Nope. There's, there's no ego right now. I'm covered in bird poop. and everyone's Might as well laugh. Me. <laughs> right and you're cracking up and i'm telling the story on a podcast so here's the point i'm trying to make yeah as a composer we really have to get a handle on the ego yes mm-hmm. right you said yeah. something really important earlier i want to camp out on but before i go i'll say this you know it's interesting i, I do these podcasts because i like people and mm-hmm. i like talking to people right i am interested in what everyone is doing but i'm much more interested in who people are Mm. And so that's that's why we're actually chatting. We will get into all this cool stuff we're doing, but I'm much more interested in just. Oh, this is stuff. fun already. So yeah. I mean, it's not more <laughs> more about um, you as a person. I, I, and you know, I've lost my train of thought on that. Um, mm, let me think about it. I was I was gonna say bird poop. There, there was bird. There was bird poop. Oh, here it is. Ego. Okay, you had said something about I have this boyfriend and he's going and saving lives, and mm-hmm. I'm just sitting here practicing these notes yeah. and. Look, I agree with this. Like, I'm not disagreeing with this. Something that I, I have experienced, not just in Los Angeles. I mean, like you, I've, I've been all mm-hmm. over the world. Like, mm-hmm. Things that I've experienced is there is, for some reason, this really weird, um, inflated uh, kind of ego in the composer world. There really is. It happens often. You'll, you'll meet people, and mm-hmm. it's very... You, you will clearly see that it does not matter who people are. It matters what they do or what right. they did or what mm-hmm. they worked on. I'll be the first one to tell you, I don't care who anybody is. <laughs> um, let, me, let me rephrase that. I don't care what anybody does. What right. I care about is you know, who they are. And right. if, if they are not a good person, I don't care what movie you worked on. Right. Dude, it's a movie. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't care what award you have on your wall. It yeah. has to be dusted. You know? <laughs> At the end of the day, what matters is people. Okay, yeah, I yeah. am not going to rabbit trail too much on that stuff, but we were yeah. sharing those stories about... Um, You're you know. right, but I have to say something that I learned later on. I mean, yeah. I did get that calling to come back to music through yeah. my exile to Italy, but then what happened later on when I became more soloist on stage and I had... Yeah more people come to me uh, after concerts and, and telling me how they felt is, is how they, music was actually a part of healing them. A lot of them cried or felt, you know, that they were hurt in some way by what I gave through music. And, and that made me realize that music is actually healing people as well, even right. if it's a different way than medicine. So in a way, I'm still kind of helping in that, no, <laughs> in that sense, you know. I think you're right. I think you're right there. I think it's exactly correct. It is like, it does heal those emotional wounds. And sometimes those emotional wounds are very physical. You can feel like when you have a broken heart, you can feel it. Oh yes, It's very true. And and I am, and I definitely don't want to take any validity away from that and, and, and how 
what we do as composers can help people. I guess mm-hmm. the point I, I definitely want to clearly make is it's a pretty cush gig we get to hang right. out in studios yeah. and push notes around, you know, yes. and, yeah. and I'll be the first one to tell you, my ego is never going to get inflated because I push notes around. <laughs> it's not going <laughs> to no. happen. I'm a husband and a dad who got pooped on. That's the guy I want to be. <laughs> That's like the perfect thing. <laughs> That's great. Who got pooped on? Um, okay. So, so I, so let's, let's move forward a little bit. So yeah. you, you got some crazy stuff going on. I want to ask you, you, um, you said something about, you did some martial arts, mm-hmm. you, did some, you did some yoga, very, yep. phys- very physical lady. And I'm seeing you upside down twirling with a violin. Like, <laughs> what in the world is going <laughs> on here? What is this all about? How did this start? What is this called? Tell me everything okay. about it. Well, um, that was actually a little over 12 years ago. I was doing a musical show and I Um, Well, first of all, when I was three, I started doing gymnastics and my first love was gymnastics. It was not even music. I started music a year after and I did both for five years. And when I was nine, um, um, my coach, my gymnastic coach, suggested that I go to the provincial, which was kind of the national team, to move on to maybe train for, you know, national competitions, maybe the Olympics and whatever. And that was what I really wanted to do. My, my first idol was Nadia Kamenechi. So um, my dream got completely shattered when I was nine and the gymnics club, that, that national club, just saw my you know weight and height and I just didn't fit in. I was not the body they wanted to, you know, <laughs> to have in their team. I, I was a little too tall, too big, whatever. Um, and so that was it. That my my yeah. main dream got shattered. So I continued in music, but obviously that passion stayed in me. And that's why I always kept on doing something. I was physical. I'm, I need to work out. I need to do something. Not that I'm a very much of a team sports person, but I need bicycling. Uh, martial arts was very important for me. Yoga as well. Um, Pilates and dance a little bit. And when I did this musical, um, in 2007 and 8 the the stage director and choreographer they were really cool and um i just kept telling them well you know make me dance or do something you know i just i don't want to be just standing there and all these dancers and singers going around like you know why not do something more than just be playing on stage and so i ended up actually standing on dancers swirling around and playing i was having a ball (laughs) this was fun on dancers Uh, Well, yeah, on the shoulders, on the dancers, you know, on stage. And then, you know, they would pick me up and swirl me around as I was playing on stage. And, you know, we had to practice this because that was, you know, a little bit complex. Um, And then I told the choreographer, I said, you know, I'd like to try something. And I told her about my first dream. And I said, I want to try to do something aerial with my violin. And she knew a coach with Cirque Eloise, which was related to Cirque uh, du Soleil as well and so i called this guy up and <laughs> he didn't answer <laughs> i think he thought i was completely nuts um and i called back and i said look i know you think i'm nuts but i really want to try this so we ended up trying different apparels like you know uh, silks and, and trapeze and lots of different things and he actually noticed quite early that i was strong and i had a lot of experience like with dance and whatever else um yoga and i was flexible so he saw that I actually had potential. So he took me on and trained me for six months. And after that first six months of intense pain, I can say that, um, I did my first live performance on TV in a harness where I was performing with a, the band and the singers um, on actually Bring Me to Life. That was the first tune I played on. And it was just incredible i mean the feeling i had and just swirling and flying and playing and and pain as well because i actually had to stop two weeks i had some sort of bursitis from just mm-hmm. training with not great uh equipment at the time so i didn't have the the you know the budget to buy these amazing harness and whatever so um but i did this became just like a, a passion project for me that i kept going i kept doing on the side and and became kind of huge. I opened for the um, 
the um, uh, what they call it the um, NHL uh, the match oh this big hockey game every yeah you know the well, I don't follow hockey the but star the, yeah sure I'll, you know what I mean <laughs> whatever you tell me I'll say yep <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> the all-star game. That's what I meant. The all-star game, the NHL all-star game. So I ended up coming down from 100 feet uh, from the top of that stadium over the ice. And, um, oh, you know, with 25,000 people cheering, it was just amazing. I, had, I, I did that number with different um, events or TV shows over the world for about 12 years so far. I actually had two planned one this month and one next month for like really major events in Quebec that got canceled, mm. unfortunately, but I'm still doing it. <laughs> You're still doing yeah. material work. <laughs> I, you know, I don't do it much. It's, it's maybe a couple of times a year, but it's just this kind of project that brings me joy. It's also a challenge every time because, you know, I do have to train for it and I don't train in my living room. Obviously I need a coach. I need a special place to train and, it it's got some pain involved. It's not something your body is made to do. You know? When you're when you're moving around, uh, and I just mean like physically in and out uh, with distance from the rest of the performers, and then you're upside down. Mm -hmm. Like how how much intonation issues pop up, tuning problems. Well, I mean, I it's funny that I practiced a lot on trampoline. I practiced in different, you know different challenges to try to train my muscles to adjust as fast as they could to anything that could happen, like a little jolt or, because it's already micro millimeters, you know, uh, on the violin and you're out of tune. So it is a big issue and I never wanted to fake it. Like I don't want to have a backup track. So every time I play, I really play for real. So if there is a little scratch, well, people know that yeah, I'm not faking this. You know, this is actually hard. Um, I'd rather have that and have one wrong note and people notice that, yeah, I'm really playing for real than having completely perfect and people knowing that I'm just, you know, faking it. Has there, um, yeah. but I had to train a lot and, and, um, it's a lot of adaptation over the, the gravity also, you know, the bow pressure when I'm upside down, I have to press on the violin upside down to push it in. But then when I'm normal sort of thing, then. I don't, or it's going to scratch, but that actually evolves continuously as I swirl or twist or it, so it's, it's really fascinating um, how the body can actually adapt so well when you train it. It really is fascinating. Do you have any uh, video links you can send me to add in the description of this? Cause I would love for everyone to see this. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I'll My next question is, was there ever a hiccup or issue in any of the rigging or any, did you get stuck yes. upside down? Yes, I did. <laughs> tell me, tell me yeah. this story. <laughs> oh gosh. Where was this performance? Oh, the, well, I mean, now it's funny, then it wasn't, but. Hey, bird poop, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, the Edmonton Oilers opening game and okay. there was a ceremony and the, well, because I had done the all-star game, they saw me do this in Montreal and they're like, yeah, we want her to open with the circuit was again. And so go to Edmonton and start rehearsing. And, you know, the place kind of looks old. It's an old arena. And, yeah. and I'm looking up, I'm like, yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> I mean, okay. And the guys are super sweet and like, okay. And they meet, they make you sign all these discharges of like, you know, whatever. Oh. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, what happens is that on the dress rehearsal, uh, I start from coming down from the ceiling and one motor blocks. Mm. And, and so there were actually big old chains, like they were really old, old rigs and one motor blocks, but the other doesn't. So I'm, I'm like suspended on one side with my head halfway down and I, I can't move. I'm, I'm like 75 feet over the ice. And I'm like, okay. And I'm thinking, yeah, I just had that conversation this morning. That that was true. That was really weird. The the, you know, the chance of that happening. This guy said, yeah, you know, yeah, it did happen to me that I got stuck. And they just will maybe find a way to go and pick you up uh, from you know 
in some ways from there if this ever happened and he actually just mentioned that in the morning and it did happen i was like oh well in a way it reassured me but i was thinking okay the odds of both of these big chains uh breaking is 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 not gonna, likely to happen like my one well, maybe one of them but you know i think maybe one will <laughs> keep me alive oh, but yeah. it's still really scary and you see all these people on the ice panicking seeing me and just just on walkie talkies and cell phones and just screaming to get me out of there um and it took about half an hour um, oh my gosh they, they actually kept the uh, dress rehearsal going because of time and schedule they couldn't stop it so that Natalie was will be fine around. guys she'll <laughs> be fine just uh, keep doing <laughs> chap chap <laughs> that's ridiculous <laughs> and, and the thing is that I actually kept my cool during that time <laughs> because I was talking to myself. But when came the performance, that's where the nerves came out. And right. that's somehow then uh, that, oh, my God, I was shaking like a leaf because I was thinking of all the catastrophic <laughs> outcomes that could happen. They changed the motors. They did everything. Like, like they were really... Um, good about it and they, they really wanted me to be safe but now i'm playing with new motors and stuff and i i remember that was probably the most difficult performance i've had to do in the longest five minutes over the ice is <laughs> yeah. there any is there any video of that dress rehearsal <laughs> i think i might be able to find it it was it was actually on youtube for a while i don't know if they kept it there that oh, so cool. they actually did some kind of not documentary, but they documented this, and you can see the people kind of talking and <laughs> panicking. I love it. <laughs> I'll try to find it. Yeah. Please send it over. Now, okay. listen, we popped around a little bit. I'm curious about when you – okay, talk to me about the transition to L.A. I mean, you, mm. you live here now, right? Right. So tell um, me about that. Like, how did you decide this is where I need to be? How would you post up here? Talk to me all about this. Okay. Well, there's a lot of life events that kind of – led me to this uh first of all i was married um until 2015 and um i have a son a 20 year old son now not with him but you know um just to give a little context so you don't look 20. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have a 20 year old okay. yeah well thank you but yeah um hilarious so i've been I've been attracted to the United States uh, musically forever. I mean, I, I go back to New York regularly. Um, I, I've had coaches there and it's, it's just been a love story with New York in particular. But um, in 2015, actually a little before that, I started doing online courses with Berkeley online. Um, I actually started that, I think, in 2011 while I was on tour in Siberia with a pop singer <laughs> oh. I had so much time that I needed to find something to do I'm not like gonna party our you know hours away so I started doing those and I loved it so much I ended up doing the whole film and TV uh, scoring uh, certificate like a 30 credit master's certificate yeah. thing and I loved it and then while I started doing that, I started getting credits and getting series in Montreal and scoring for main titles and, you know, variety shows, stuff like that. And, and I was like, yeah, I think I really love doing this. I didn't want to start performing, but I thought this could be something else that I love to do. And, well, the market in the industry being what it is in Montreal, it's fairly small. And, and I'm not going to hide that being a woman doesn't really help. Um, so I didn't feel like the opportunities were there. And I definitely wanted to knock on the doors in in L.A. Uh, because I knew that was where the industry was. Yeah. Uh, so 2015, I didn't even know I was going to get separated then. I decided to um, go to the AFM, the American Film Market, yeah. and meet people. I had won a competition and been to Ghent World Soundtrack Award and already had met some people that recommended that I go there. So Let I me interrupt that, for a second. Sorry, yeah. is AFM, is that the one they do in Santa Monica every year? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I have not attended it. that. I, I okay. always, every year I want to go to that and I never go. It's very interesting, actually. Yeah. Now it's, it's getting more and more interesting, I find. Anyway, very so good. I went there and that was, actually that was a shock, to be honest. Okay. Um, but what happened actually is that 
two weeks before I went there, we separated and decided on a divorce. So that was like, oh my gosh, um, I was dealing with this painful time in my life um, and also excited of going to go there, but also literally dealing, buying a house. You know, I, I visited a house the day before I left for the AFM and it was like a whirlwind of things happening. But what happened is I landed in LA, went to Santa Monica and I walked on the beach and I cannot explain the feeling I had. It was like, this is my home. This is where I want to be. This is the next chapter of my life. And yeah. it was so clear, but I had no means of making that happen. At the time I, I was just, you know, like there's nothing budget wise that made this possible. There was nothing family wise. I mean, my kid was still 15. Um, I was like, okay, fine. But I'm giving myself three years. And that was my three year plan that I decided then and there to, to start. Wow. And so I literally bought a house knowing I was going to sell it eventually. That was what I, you know, my dream was. And again, it was like, yep, yeah, failure is not an option. That's where I'm going. <laughs> you know? um, and a lot of people kind of told me, yeah, what do you think you're going to do there? I mean, I, well, your age in a way, and, and you're just starting composing. Like, there's so much competition over there. Why would you succeed? I mean, people have been living there for years. They don't make it. And, and I was like, and blah, blah, blah. I do not care what you think. This is how I feel. And I have, you know, for me is, I don't care about failure. I care about regrets. I don't want to have any regrets in my life. So failure is something that, yes, I have had failures in my life and they don't kill you. They make you grow. Yeah. And I was like, nope, I'm not going to have any regrets. So that started the plan, the three-year plan. And um, that's when I started coming back to LA at least five times a year, hmm. networking. I was planning out um, around events that were happening, networking events or workshops or internships, ended up interning with Michael Levine. Um, I did some workshops in New York that actually helped me get to LA because a lot of the people teaching at those workshops were like Nathan Barr and, and Matt Quayle, um, you know, and so they actually helped me in my dream in many ways. Um, but it was a process. It was definitely a process. I even told my son at the time, I said, you know, I just want you to know that when you're going to be 18, you will have a choice to make. You can come with me. You can stay here, but I'm going to be moving over there. Mm. Did he come? He did, actually. He did for a year. He studied at the New York Film Academy. Um, he's an actor. He's been an actor until the since he was six that's very cool um he's also very musical um plays the piano and right now he's kind of still finding himself but very interested in the acting he's gone back to montreal for now mainly because he cannot work legally here and we're actually doing the green card process for him um started that last year but how long that's going to take now i don't know <laughs> Kids are the coolest, aren't yes, they? Yes, yes. No, he's, it's just been an amazing experience last year when he was here. Um, and yeah, probably we'll be back next year. Yeah, I was just going to shamelessly plug my 12-year-old. You should. 12-year-old <laughs> Emmy-nominated son. That's awesome. That's just great. <laughs> I mean, you guys are doing amazing. He did the work. That kid, uh, the kids, that, that little dude is so talented. And I tell you what, man, like, it's wild when you watch these, not only watch them find themselves as they're growing, but they just keep becoming cooler and cooler every right. year. It's yeah. pretty wild. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, I want to ask you about, uh, so you land here, you're in LA. Mm -hmm. You yeah. made great connections throughout, even before you came here. Now you're here mm -hmm. and now you're working, doing the, the composer thing, right? So let's talk about yeah. that. How did you like hit the ground running and how are you finding gigs? Like talk to the younger you who are, who is your mirror image and they're trying to do what you're doing. How, how do they get going? I think it's being, um, how do I say that? Like more than devoted. It's, it's just 
it's just not resting it's just being restless it's i think it's my nature it's it's just always wanting to find another another way to get in uh another person to contact another you know and and doing it in a in a nice way not being hypocritical or anything just being honest in the way you do it and why you're doing it like creating contact with somebody for me has to be genuine i anytime that for some reason i've tried to find work with a person that i didn't really feel a good connection with it never worked like it was all it's always a failure so if i don't feel a human connection there like you know not that they have to be my best friend in life but you know at least some kind of likelihood of something you know we have to be on a certain level of communication um it just it just it becomes too much meaningless and i think like you say you know i'm also interested in who people are and working with a team of really nice people like working with empath for example and you guys at crime sonics it's just it's like being part of a family. You, you're part of people who care about you genuinely. And that just makes such a big difference. Um, and I think that's how I got in initially. I, I didn't have a gig when I landed here uh, in 2018. That's when I decided in July. Um, I was kind of the main move. I didn't, I had not sold my house yet officially, but I kind of took a lease and had, um, also a car leased here for three years. So that was pretty official. Um, yeah. you know, that was like, okay, I'm, I'm just doing that. I'm taking the leap, but I did not have a, a gig at that time. It was just, yeah, let's, let's try this out. Um, and I was work well working. I was writing for empath, um, hoping for placements, which, you know, I did start getting, and that was encouraging um started working with you on that album um the emotional violin album which i'm really proud of uh, and actually while we're chatting i'll do it live right here on our podcast we're talking about placements i'm going down <laughs> with the placements on my <laughs> latest report your track bad little girl sophisticated criminals used only in paris used crimes of victoria british mystery criminal wow. romance, sad violins dignified defendant i could keep going i won't wow who cares about this <laughs> But after we're done with the episode, I can read you this whole list. That's great. Yeah, you're, starting awesome. to get, you're starting to get a bunch of them. Yay, um. yay. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I mean, I started doing that. I knew that that was kind of a long-term thing because you, you never get money from this very quickly and, and placements take time. And But it just felt like this was uh, an incentive for me to keep creating and yes. and develop myself my voice um in different areas like empath is very different from crime sonics and i'm also writing for house international a little bit and a, another uh french music package over there which led into the universal um connection where i've, I've been doing a couple of tracks as well for them so kind of spreading my wings a little bit and at one point like i say families kind of care about each other and um Michael Levine learned about uh, Hallmark looking for new talent, uh, especially Canadian talent. Hmm. And uh, he just said, I think you should write to this, this person because they're looking for, for people from Canada. And I was like, okay. And I just wrote like an email. And then um, I remember they asked for some tracks, demos and different styles. So I did that. Then they asked for more tracks. I sent a second round of demos. And then, I got asked for an interview, but at the time I was so used to those casual coffees and stuff like that. I just thought I was going to be in a coffee shop, whatever. And the, they said, no, no, it's at Crown Media. I'm like, oh, okay. And I ended up having this formal interview. I remember leaving here on a Friday and my, my son was actually FaceTiming with my parents. And I said, well, okay, wish me luck. And my son was like, oh, please don't be too disappointed if this doesn't work. Like, he was so afraid that so sweet. I might just cry after this this didn't work um because you know money wasn't great and i was like trying to make ends meet and hoping this would work but i told him you know what this is already a victory i had i have never had an official interview yet this is already victory for me to be there considered at that level 
I'm happy, even if this doesn't work. And so I left with that attitude and that took off a lot of pressure because I, I went in the office just being happy to be there and right. not trying to sell anything. I just was very honest about my experience, very confident about what I could do. And I also told them, no, I didn't, I didn't uh, do this yet, but because I did this, I'm confident that I can do this, you know? And I thought it went really well. It lasted about an hour. There were four executive and I came back and I felt, okay, well, I'm in the bank, maybe, you know, whatever happens. And the next Monday, three days later, I get a call and like, we found a movie for you. And I said, what? <laughs> so Amazing. That's how it started in May. Um, actually in end of March last year, but I started scoring in May last year. And since then, I've just delivered my fifth movie for Hallmark. Isn't so yeah, it's been pretty amazing. <laughs> Send me all the links and I'll add all the, the links to them in the sure. description below. So yeah. let's talk about that scoring process. Do you, mm -hmm. do you have a sweet home studio? What's going on? Well, uh, I wish I could say that I have a fabulous studio. I'm, I'm more in a campground right now. It's more of a transition <laughs> space, I feel. Um, but it's inspiring and it's, it's just, I actually like it because it's my little nest of, of, of music, you know, and yeah. I don't care if it's a palace or not. It's, that's where I create my music and that's, that's what matters. Um, I do miss my huge studio that I had in my house in Montreal, but you know, rent being different here. <laughs> I will very, very different. <laughs> you know, I keep saying you get three rooms instead of three stories. That's the right. difference you get. Yeah. But um, yeah, so. <laughs> one's the bathroom, one's the kitchen, right? Exactly. <laughs> the other one's the deck. <laughs> there you go. Um, but I'm very happy. I'm in a really nice, you know, area. And um, so, um, yeah, I set up my little studio here and it's very functional. Um, and it's great. I mean, today you can work with amazing gear from home, which you couldn't do just a, a little while ago. So it's just amazing that I can actually score these movies from my home right now. Um, I do invest in the best samples. I mean, I haven't gone... Um, you know, clothing, like, like, you know, fashion shopping for so long. I just put out all my money in samples and plugins and, right. <laughs> and become a true geek. Yeah. Um, it's you know, so fun though. <laughs> it's just, you know, and I was so happy to get my new Royer 121. It was like, I can't believe I bought this. I could have bought so many nice clothes for this, but hey, I got a great mic. <laughs> that is a wonderful mic. I love that mic. So, um, yeah, so I basically have invested anything that came in on gear and just getting better, uh, better samples and better quality to be competitive because you do need to have that to be up. And, you know, you're competing with every, you know, the standard of the industry is just so high that you can't just use the low, you know, quality samples. So I've invested, I, I don't even want to know how much I've invested. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um agree yeah I yeah don't. <laughs> i don't think we'll go there i don't want to go there yep. <laughs> so, that is part of the gig if you're getting it is part of the gig, gig. You, got, you, you, you gotta have the sounds it, it can't yeah. sound fake it can't sound dated right. it has to sound cutting edge stuff well yeah. i tell you what look we are approaching the one hour mark i do okay. like to keep these episodes right around one hour mm -hmm. and to all who are listening, let me tell you, we are not even scratching the surface <laughs> of what we could talk about. NatalieBoneInMusic.com. I think if someone clicks on that link and looks at your homepage, they're going to be like, that would have been a nine-hour podcast. I mean, <laughs> everything you're doing, your career. I know it's funny, but it's, it's true. <laughs> it's really, yeah, no, it's, it's, no. <laughs> it, it's true. Um, Natalie, you did a wonderful artist release for Crime Sonics, Emotional Violin. I think Thank I you. can confidently say now that we have licensed everything on that at some point in time. I think everything That's you've so heard awesome. before. Yeah, you're doing just a wonderful job. Just amazing stuff. I highly recommend anyone go listen to the Emotional Violin artist release, Nanny Bonin, CrimeSonics.com. So good, so good. <laughs> Thank so you. Good. I'm so proud of it. And so it's, it was so much fun to do as well. I, it's, and it was one of the first artist releases yeah. we did, I think. 
I think so. I think it was so, one of the first three or something. Yep. I love uh, I love seeing it on the site because it. I absolutely love that release. Um, let's end with this. Is there a, one other you know golden nugget? One other little piece of advice? Anything else that you feel like I forgot to ask? If you were speaking directly to someone just moving to Los Angeles, mm-hmm. they want to be a media. Uh, composer, music for media mm-hmm. composer. Like any anything else? Could you could you give from your own experience? I just really think that you need to be fearless. I just really think uh, again that don't worry about whatever everybody else says. You know, and there's something that Spielberg. I read Spielberg saying is that listen to those whispers, and that was very inspiring to mm-hmm. me. Yeah. Uh, that little voice that uh, that's you know whispering in your ear, that is the most true you know the truest mes- message that your heart is telling you. You have to listen to that. It's not going to scream at you, but you are always going to hear it, and that's what you need to listen to. And the second thing that really helped me <laughs> um, was this this um, sentence. It says, "You know, jump, and the net will appear." Mm. Um, and it did. I think when you generally follow your heart, somehow it it just works out. The universe really helps helps you when you do the steps. Yeah, I think your 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 Facebook says, "Be foolish, be honest, be kind." Yes, yes, that that's also another thing I love to think of. <laughs> I love those old things. They're just very inspiring for me. Well, they make sense. Yeah. Right? I, I guess I'll leave with a couple as well. One of them is, you know, it's funny. Do, do you boo, right? I know it's not glamorous, but I think about even my own path here in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And it was not until I really just decided, you know what? I don't want to do what other people do. I want to do right. what I want to do. Right. And when I started doing what I wanted to do, man, did things start falling into place. And so I guess the point I'm trying to make is to whoever is listening, be on a relentless, never-ending pursuit of trying to figure out who you are, your uniqueness, personally, relationally, Mm -hmm. musically, sonically, who figure out you, only you can do you, and you are going to be the best at it. Exactly. You know, and so, That's well said. Love that. That is the truth. All right, Natalie. Hey, thank hey. you for hanging out with me for an hour. And we are thank out. Thank you. We are out of here. <laughs> thank you.